Good afternoon and good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. This session is part of our second annual Data Privacy Day at the World Bank Group, and our panel is entitled Global Voices on Privacy. It features some of the brightest contemporary minds in the privacy and digital rights spaces. I encourage all of you to please use the question and answer box in front of you to share any comments or questions you might have during the session. And time permitting, we will get to these at the end of the hour. Um, my name is Jennifer Trotsko, and I am the Chief Data Privacy Officer at the International Finance Corporation, which is the private sector arm of the World Bank Group. And I'm very excited to be moderating today's session. Uh, joining me today are Mr. Jules Polonetsky, CEO, Future of Privacy Forum, Mr. Max Schrems, CEO, NOYB, European Center for Digital Rights, Ms. Boyana Bellamy, President, the Center for International Policy Leadership, and Mr. David Nadine, consultant to CGAP, the consultative group to assist the poor. And delivering closing remarks for us today, we have Dr. Sandy Okoro, the Senior Vice President and General Counsel for the World Bank Group and Vice President for Compliance of the World Bank. But first, to kick us off, we are very honored to have Mr. Christopher Stevens, Vice President and General Counsel of the International Finance Corporation, delivering opening remarks. Chris oversees multiple areas at IFC that are relevant to privacy, legal, compliance, and risk management, to name a few. He is also the lead sponsor of IFC's privacy program, and we are thrilled to have you here and kicking us off today, Chris. So with that, I will ask you to join the conversation and start us off. Good, thanks. Thanks, Jennifer, and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Um, you know, as we all know and have seen, the data regulatory landscape has changed dramatically in the last few years. And even since I joined IFC in September 2019, only about 14 months ago, the way in which we seek and obtain and store uh, and use data uh, and share data has changed dramatically. But in recognition of these changes, Jennifer and her team at the IFC Data Privacy Office have been dealing with the challenges of working with private sector clients across the globe to determine the best practices of how we can best meet our responsibilities in this uh, fast changing privacy environment. Entire industries suddenly uh, had to transition to remote work as we all became experts in Zoom and Microsoft Teams and as COVID-19 contact uh, tracing apps became an important tool and topic of discussion. The issues, the nature and the complexity of our digital lives and the privacy concerns around them are increasing dramatically. Privacy professionals have had to adapt to all these sudden and unanticipated changes in how we live and work. And once, uh, one of the great questions for the future, which our panelists will cover in the coming hour, is what becomes of the new normal once we finally put the pandemic behind us and how does privacy fit in? All of us have been forced to replace face-to-face -face meetings and many of our transactions with a more digital ex existence and experience in the last year. World Bank staff, for example, are developing products and services up to help keep companies in business and to help preserve jobs in developing economies all over the world and are processing hundreds of new projects with new clients and even in new sectors and, 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 and investment modalities, all while working remotely for almost a year. So will people increasingly become comfortable with sharing our personal information digitally now that we've been forced to do so and may get a little bit more used to it? Uh, and everything from our jobs to schoolwork to doctor's appointments and through apps and videos. Uh, only time and perhaps our panelists will tell. And of course, COVID-19 is not the only factor impacting today's privacy debate. Uh, the cross-border uh, cross transfer of personal data took center stage again just this last July with the Schrems II decision handed down by the European Court of Justice. For those of you who are not familiar, uh, the Schrems II decision calls into question the future of international data flows and the use of data transfer mechanisms, particularly between the European Union and the United States. An important question then is how to fairly and securely foster the cross-border transfer of personal data. Given that the central case is named after one of our panelists today, I'm looking forward to hearing more about that topic shortly. So without further ado, I'd like to thank you again for coming and for virtually attending and hand it back over to Jennifer and the panel. Jennifer? Thank you, Chris. 
Uh, and now I would like to each uh, ask each of our distinguished panelists to briefly introduce yourselves and to share some initial thoughts on today's topics. Um, please uh, limit your comments to two minutes, roughly speaking. Uh, so let's get started first with you, Jules. Thanks and um, welcome everybody. Um, Jennifer, thanks, and the team at the World Bank for helping put this on. Uh, you, you know, the Future of Privacy Forum, we work with the senior chief privacy officers, um, academics, regulators, civil society, everybody who's struggling to deal with the right balances, the right areas of what is necessary, what is proportional, what is moral, what is ethical. And it's getting more complicated every day because there's such a vast number of areas where data and information underpins just about every area of our human existence. Um, I think we want to recognize that we're not talking about privacy with a very small P here. We're not talking about, do you have a privacy policy? We're not solely talking about, um, are you sharing on social media or are you not, right? We're talking about what's really the right balance between, I don't know, safety and security and government surveillance? Um, do I have the right to walk outside and protest or shop without that information being recorded? If I'm working remotely, what should my employer know or not know? We're really talking about the rights and freedoms of you know an individual in the world. So yes, it does mean, can I hide and can I not engage and can I be private? But I hope, and I think everyone listening appreciates that we're really talking about the power balances around the world between commercial, big companies, big organizations, even big not-for-profits, right? Everyone's got a mission and increasingly using data is part and parcel. And so we're really debating, I think, some of the very significant rules, some of which are already in place. They're not new. We've had uh, concepts the reason today is Data Privacy Day is because we're recognizing the opening of signatures many years ago of Convention 108, a treaty that countries around the world have signed on to, and uh, principles that are reflected in many areas of legislation around the world. We're hoping perhaps in the U.S. we'll have some progress towards those, but um, it, it is a set of rules. But at the same time, we're, we're struggling to apply many of those rules to the new technologies, to AI, to, um, to, to living our lives at home. So delighted to be engaging in this conversation with all of you. Um, but uh, a reminder that this big picture is far more than, quote unquote, small privacy. It's really about the rights and freedoms that we all expect to be living with each other and in our relationship with companies and governments and society. Thank you, Jules. Thank you. I'd next like to turn to Max for his opening comments. Max? We've got the microphone issue there. Yep, there you go. Uh, <laughs> hey, welcome. Uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, my name is Max Schrems. I'm working at NOIP. We basically do um, enforcement of European privacy law. Um, I want to probably catch up right on this bigger picture. And I think it's it's even to us oftentimes bigger than, than the mere question of privacy. We think yes, privacy oftentimes is a subset of an idea of like informational self-determination. And as we move into an information age, and I think it's it's always important to stress that we're at probably the first you know, millimeter of going into this big new information age. Um, it, the big question long run is gonna be, who is gonna have the power over this new world where information determines so much? And I think it's it's probably similar as as other debates that we had as you know the you know we moved into a um, industrial age where workers' rights and so on became totally different than than before the industrialization. And we have similar issues now with privacy and and data. That um, the big question and again privacy is a subset of that is how do we determine who has power over that? Uh, which governments, which countries have power over it, also on an international stage. If we talk about, for example, surveillance, which countries can surveil the rest of the world, um, but also within our countries, for example, or within um, the individual and the private user, um, how much we can determine that. I think one important part, um, as I usually look at that, is privacy is one of these elements that can shield you a little bit from you know, the, the bigger guy in some way. Um, but there's also other elements, for example, like, like um, freedom of information, um, right to access, stuff that kind of redistributes information the other way around. Um, and I think these elements are, are will altogether probably in 
50 years, something like that, uh, when we have Convention 108 in, you know, 100 years anniversary, something like that. Um, and the data protection day, therefore, um, will probably be determined somewhat, but we're still at the very beginning of all of this. And I guess it's a very interesting journey and it's not going to end because as with like, you know, commercial world, it's it's a big question of who pays how much taxes and whatever is going to be the digital debate as well. And this debate is never ending. So we know that from other areas. Thank you, Max. Thank you. And uh, Bayana, can we ask you to introduce yourself? Thank you, Jennifer, and hello, everybody, and happy Data Privacy Day. As I have said a couple of times today, as I was speaking with some other events, every day should be Data Privacy Day. It's a little bit like Valentine's. Not only do we want flowers on the 14th of February, we want every day to be Data Privacy Day. And thank you, World Bank, for getting us together. And I also want to applaud your efforts and your work in actually setting this data privacy policy for World Bank, IFC, and demonstrating your own accountability. And I'd like to take my two minutes maybe to remind everybody uh, about the importance of accountability. I lead CIPL, Center for Information Policy Leadership, um, and our mission is to ensure and enable responsible and accountable use of data and new technologies in a way that protects privacy, but also enables economic and societal benefits and growth. And I think the answer to how do we do that is through uh, uh, accountability and co enhance corporate digital responsibility. And I want to say immediately, this is not just for big companies, this is for everybody from SMEs, startups, to public sector, public sector organizations, as well as international organizations. We all have to step up our privacy accountability. Um, and really, I have seen the change in this well, 20 years of CIPL, but seven years since I have been in this particular role. Uh, and I think that privacy has certainly moved from backroom to the boardroom. And that's what we want to encourage. I have been on a mission together with Jules and others in promoting responsible data use and corporate digital responsibility with senior leaders, with governments, with regulators. And I'm seeing organizations implementing and building data privacy management programs from top down, bottom up, with leadership and oversight, with risk assessments, with people, policies, technology, rules and verifications, right? Based on elements of accountability. And that's what we want to encourage. And you know, this isn't just, we're not doing this just because the laws require us to do. That's I think the big change, right? It's not about the law of this. This is about actually existential um, uh, behaviors. It's about culture, it's about trust and it's about sustainability of our businesses and our mission. Either, even if we are World Bank or we are just corporate uh, entity, we have got a mission. And so our mission is linked to data. So data privacy for me and for corporate boards and, 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 and um, public sector organizations has to be first about enabling data-driven value creation. How do we ensure we can actually use data responsibly for new business models, for uh, better access, um, democratization, equality, whatever you want to do it, but as well as for corporate goals. Secondly, it's about um, using um, uh, accountability to um, um, address these increased expectations of people um, who we engage with and our business partners as well. It's also about being accountable vis-a-vis -vis, uh, shareholders, vis-a-vis -vis investors. You have heard about ESG investors, right? And privacy is going to become new letter on top of ESG. So it's going to become a little bit like, like corporate social responsibility, right? And I think it's true because data is not new oil. No, data is like new environment, new environmental protection. We have to make sure we nurture digital ecosystem. We ensure the data can be used responsibly and we protect it and we protect people who sit behind that data. I think that's the kind of uh, world we want to live in. And then finally, we also want to make sure that we address the changes in law, we address the um, uh, future-proof our program so that we can uh, be flexible, we can continue to share data, we can continue to comply and manage all kinds of risks. So, of course, it's about risk mitigation, but it's also about this positive business enabler, uh, societal enabler type of goals. That's what accountability is ultimately about. And I'm really excited to see 
sort of corporate world moving towards that. I mean, you talk, we talk about responsible business practices. We talk about stakeholder capitalism that's being discussed in Davos this very week, right? Um, so, you know, businesses are not there just to make profit. They're also there to actually make this world better. And I think it's about how we use data to do that. So we have to enable and um, open the possibility of data to do that, but in a responsible way. So I think accountability is the way forward. Please, let's all join and, and build that world and step up um, from SMEs to startups to public sector and big corporates to actually uh, build that corporate accountability in a better way. Thank you, Bayana. Thank you. Uh, I certainly share your passion for data and for doing the right thing with data. So uh, thank you for that. David, last but not very much not least, I turn to my colleague, David, um, and uh, ask you to make a few opening remarks. Um, thanks, Jennifer. David Medine, uh, a data protection consultant at CGAP, and it's a pleasure to be back for the second World Bank Group uh, Privacy Day. Um, I would like to talk, pick up on the theme of power relationships, and in, in this case, between individuals and companies. Um, Right now, uh, individuals, consumers have to fend for themselves in this data world, um, and it's an unfair burden. Uh, people are barraged with privacy notices and choices uh, on websites, uh, apps, Internet of Thing devices, um, on and on and on. Um, and the problem is that the privacy notices people receive are not read and are not readable. Um, and it's a particular challenge in the developing world uh, where there are liter literacy and technology challenges. Um, so as a result, consumers don't really have control over how their data is used and disclosed. And um, so it's really time to move away from the notice and consent model of data protection, which on its face seems to uh, empower consumers and give them agency, but in fact uh, is just the opposite and it makes them beholden to uh, privacy notices and privacy policies um, that really offer very little choice um, and understanding of how the data is gonna be used. And so CGAP we've proposed two use restrictions and puts the burden on companies where the burden really belongs. One is a legitimate purposes restriction, which is to only use data for legitimate purposes, which is what is re relevant to the product or service being offered and what a consumer would reasonably expect how their data would be used by the company. Um, or alternatively, a fiduciary duty responsibility where companies can only use data for the benefit of their customers and, and not just for their own benefit. Uh, in either of those cases, there are opportunities to aggregate or de-identify information. And so it can be used by companies for innovation, new product development, um, and reaching out with services, um, but not at the price of individual privacy. Um, so I think it's time to shift the model, um, which made sense back when it started in the 80s and maybe even the 90s. Uh, but I think um, in the world we live in now, it's really antiquated and it's time to shift the burden where it belongs to companies to make sure they make responsible use of data. Thank you. Thank, thank you, David, thank you. Uh, so now let's jump into some specific questions for our panelists. Panelists, you will have five minutes to respond to each question. And I'd like to start uh, again with Jules first. Um, we've been spending so much time on our devices, relying on new technologies in both our work and our personal lives, with many of us choosing to share our personal data to help track the spread of COVID through contact tracing apps. Once the pandemic has subsided, what do you foresee as the new normal in terms of our relationship with our personal data? Has the public become more discerning in choosing when and to whom to hand over personal data? What are your thoughts on that? You know, we've been on a journey, I'd say over the past 20 years as technology has moved from being this sort of interesting, convenient thing to this tool that ends up being uh, essential to our lives. I was once upon a time the chief privacy officer at AOL. And I will tell you, although we appreciated, you know, what we were doing, um, it wasn't until there was a terrible outage and headlines appeared around the world on the front cover of newspapers that, oh my God, what are you going to do? AOL, you know, was down. Um, and at some point we said, you know what, we're not just this nice way to do social things and, and go look up information. This is something people expect to be working and they need and their lives are dependent on it. And so as technology is integrated into just about everything we do, 
our expectations are different. This is not just a cute app that we play a game with, right? This is whether we can go to school. This is whether we can um, develop a, a, a cure to a pandemic. This is, you know, the core to our living. The pandemic has in many ways only accelerated that trend. Companies that were small have overnight become huge. Huge companies have become huger. And uh, seniors or people who were later adopters are suddenly, um, you know, uh, engaged in technology 24-7. So we've grown several years, both in adoption as well as in the complexity of the issues. And so here's what's really different. The policies here used to be insiders, experts, tech people who woke up talking about privacy. Well, today you read that an app that you use, you hear something about their privacy policy and unmask your family or your groups, go move to a different app. This is now as big news as who are you voting for for president? And in fact, it may even mean which president gets to use your platform and which tools do they use to communicate? And although you may not think about that as a privacy issue, right? It's the rules that companies are making about how we use their technology, what we say and does it get deleted and how do we moderate? Uh, again, it's very hard to draw a fine line between this is a privacy issue uh, and then this is the rules that are being set for our lives. So. I don't know where we're going to come out of this, right? Hopefully we come out of our lockdown and our shutdown, but I think we all enjoy the enhanced fact that we can engage with people that we might not have engaged with so easily. Um, I just did a telemedicine appointment and frankly, I want to continue having that telemedicine appointment because why do I need to go just to talk to my doctor, you know, when he's really just going to send me, you know, for a test and then I'm going to come back, right? I want these part, these issues. Um, Many of us are going to continue, you know, shopping uh, the way we've become used to, um, and that's going to change the way we integrate technology into our lives. So I think it's no longer an esoteric conversation. The next comment that I'll make is because it's so important, regulators want to regulate, right? This is now becoming a highly regulated uh, world. Uh, it is not just banking and health and some of the more sensitive data. Just about every jurisdiction in the world is busy figuring out how to properly regulate the issues that we're dealing with. And the people who are involved, and I know there are lots of people um, on, on this call that you know have a role, simply being a lawyer, simply being a technologist, you need to understand the statistical issues around the identification. We need to understand machine learning. We need to understand the history and the rules around ethics. And so the challenge for all of us is to help train and develop a lot of those adjacent school issues. We can read the statute, right? Um, it's not impossible to figure out what a legal statute means, but we need those adjacent skills and we need the communities affected. How do we talk to those communities uh, instead of simply saying, what we're doing is good for you, we're gonna solve these problems, right? And the World Bank, I think, and many of your um, uh, uh, stakeholders appreciate this, right? Because you can't go ahead and make uh, lending and finance and development decisions, right? Simply sitting in a you know an ivory tower and saying, this is what's good for you. Similarly, we can't make decisions about how to use data um, and expect that we'll mandate them from high on above. We need to bring in the communities that are affected. Um, you see in the U.S. now uh, and in many other jurisdictions around the world, a, a deep desire to deal with equity, deal with um, uh, balancing discrimination. And this is going to be one of the interesting issues. We need data. We need to know who's been hit hardest. And that means sensitive data, highly sensitive data. How do we work to access that data so that we can fight discrimination, that we can reach the communities, we understand how they're impacted, but have the restrictions on that data so that they know and we know that it's going to be used for social good and for benefit and not misused in some of the ways that can be harmful. So exciting times ahead. Thank you, Jules. Thank you. Um, I think bringing in the in the affected communities is really an interesting point, and I and I do hope that we can spend um, a little bit more time, perhaps later, to to explore that. You know how we could do that uh, more effectively. Uh, now I would like to turn to uh, Mr. Max Frems and um, ask you a question, Max. Um, the free flow of information 
promises immeasurable economic, developmental, and even public health opportunities. But there is also potential for exploitation if countries engage in this flow of information without a strong data protection regime. So my question for you is, what is the best way to facilitate this cross-border data flow without disadvantaging the developing countries? Max? Yeah, um, thanks a lot. Um, it's actually one of, I mean, obviously the case we fought versus the US was at the core of all of this and probably stirred up a lot of the debate globally on how we deal with data transfers a second time around. And it's unfortunately not easy to solve. So I think no one in this call or, you know, any in particular person can, can solve that issue because it's to a larger extent a, a political um, issue. And um, it's almost impossible right now, I think, that we're gonna have a consensus on what privacy is. Because one thing, and, and, and that's uh, probably a bit of a background that we have to add here is, uh, privacy is one word, but probably everybody here listening to that understands something else as being private. And uh, it's a highly cultural um, determinant if, if you think that someone is something is private or not, or how far you want to go, and how much this balancing that we talked about before should tip to the one side or the other. And um, even within Europe, we do have the GDPR now, but in in you know coming up to the GDPR, um, there was tremendous different views even within the European Union, which is a you know somewhat culturally close to each other um, world. Um, but there are totally different approaches to that. And that gets me to, to, to the problems we have kind of with these data flows is that to a large extent, um, we would need to have some kind of like coherent, um, at least somehow same ideas kind of approach to privacy. And there is even, my favorite example is the um, reasonable expectation of privacy, something that a lot of lawyers in the area have heard. But if you look at what judges in one country see as a reasonable expectation versus another country, you're ending up in totally different territories. So uh, that is a bit of the fundamental problem that we have with, with data flows. And usually we can kind of compromise on these things sometimes. You know, if we have different standards on, let's say, banking, we may be saying, okay, that's that's somehow possible to, you know, look a bit the other way if we want to have more trade with this, this or with this country or change our approach. The problem is that privacy, at least in, in more and more countries, increasingly becomes a fundamental right. So it's nothing you can just sign off or just, you know, discount somehow. And um, that is, uh, to, to a large extent, the, the, the world that I think we're in and where at least we would have to build clusters somehow of somehow coherent regulation. Because after all, um, to a large extent, I think we'll have only like reasonable data transfers and, and these possibilities once we have somehow coherent uh, legislation and somehow coherent standards. And, um, and there we get into a territory where a lot of countries, especially when in, in our cases, we're oftentimes talking about national security, have fundamentally different approaches to their own uh, citizens and foreign citizens. That's even true within the EU. Like as an Austrian, I don't have any rights in Germany when it comes to national se security cases. And um, all these issues play out here. And for us, we think that unless there is a fundamental political shift in a lot of countries, we'll have a hard time for... Um, a couple of decades probably to sort that out. Um, the one big driver for that could be the economy in the sense of if large companies realize that this difference in the law in each country is a huge burden to their data transfers and their business, um, they may just put that political weight that they have into the basket to actually get somehow coherent uh, legislation. And that is probably the final point I, I wanted to raise. I mean, we're today here on, on the 40 years of Convention 108, which is the first instrument I know of, at least, um, that has tried to have like baseline uh, principles that are more or less the same. And that could be really interesting because um, it could be one of these elements how we can get to um, a, a joint you know, kind of law. However, if you look, for example, at the US, we have a huge problem that even there, each state has different rules that may not go together well for, for different companies. Um, the very last part um, of, of the question um, on developing countries, I think, uh, again, I said at the beginning, I think we're all pretty much in a developing state on all of this. <laughs> um, if we deal with European you know, data protection authorities, there is a lot of them that are not even at the edge of development of anything. <laughs> so um, I think we're still in a very um, you know, early stage of all of this. And it, it would be hard to say that, you know, Europe has, for example, the GDPR, 
Um, but I usually call it the least stupid privacy law we know so far. So we're all at the very beginning of, of this development. And I think that is also a lot of potential to, to look at, you know, who does stuff better, how we can do things differently, all of these parts that, that could allow us to have some sort of a coherent thing. However, uh, I think the big, big issue we still have to just be honest about is that we have very different cultural views of what pr is private. And once we become seriously international, that, that hunts us. Um, as a last, last example, probably what I usually refer to is, is um, things like financials. It's usually very private in Austria. Like you don't talk even with your closest friends how much you're making, <laughs> which in the US, for example, is a rather open topic in my experience. At the other hand, for example, something like sexuality is usually something in Austria we're rather open about, while in the US that's very private. So it's not even that one country is more private than the other one is less. We even have different subject matters that, that are dealt with differently. And I think I think that's important to recognize to get to any solution. Thank you, Max. Um, really interesting to think about both the political angles of privacy and, and the cultural differences and, 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 and those kind of how do, we, how do we bring that all together and come up with some kind of cohesive uh, regulatory cluster, as you said. Um, I'm curious to hear uh, more about that. Uh, I, I assume that GDPR is, is one of those such clusters. Um, but you know, where else are we? Are, do we see clusters emerging? Would be an interesting uh, topic uh, for discussion. But let's now turn to um, Boyana with our next question. Um, Boyana, so it doesn't seem like that long ago when the issue of the hour was harmonizing the EU and, and U.S. privacy regimes, something that you contributed to personally via the Privacy Bridge Project. Um, while it is still very much a major topic in the global privacy ecosystem. The years since that time, it has grown even more complex, both with the exit of the, of the UK from the EU, California's CCPA and Prop 24, and of course, all the new privacy regulations around the world. So clearly there is a public appetite for privacy protective legislation, but there are also many opinions about how it should be done. So my question to you, is if you were to embark on a privacy bridge project today, would your job be easier or more difficult? <laughs> Listen, our jobs are so difficult, but then that's why they're so exciting. That's why they're so worthwhile. That's what makes me want to get up every day and stay at my home and work at the moment, not go to the office. But listen, Jennifer, you said, yes, Privacy Bridges was all about um, actually building bridges between transatlantic, right? And, it, and we can't always talk about harmonization because I don't think that's the right word. I think the better word is using plugs. It's a little bit like electricity, you know? Even today, you know, when I'm from UK traveling to Europe or US, I have to use that other plug that sort of translates my electricity uh, and my device into the uh, you, 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 you know, US or, or European or um, Swiss. Swiss has got three plug. Everybody's different. So that's the analogy, really, that we want to think about. And look, I actually think we have all more in common than divides us. Yes, culturally, we are different. Yes, we have got sometimes different narrative. Yes, we've got different politics around data, human rights versus not. But ultimately, the spirit and I think also um, the outcomes are very similar or even the same. Uh, think about um, security breach notification requirements in GDPR. We actually imported that from the US because US has invented security breach notification requirement. Equally, CCPR, CPRA, sorry, the new California amendments have very similar to GDPR. They've got right of access and rectification and portability and uh, sensitive data notion and compatible purpose. So, so you know, we are seeing these importations of concepts all around the world. Um, and maybe it's also important to say, to me, it's not so much the bridging between transatlantic EU and US, it really is global bridging. You know, you talk about where those other clusters of developments. We are having a very uh, pro progressive law now in Brazil, and we are excited to see how that uh, is implemented. It's huge economy. India is proposing data privacy law as well. We've got APEC cross-border privacy rules. There's a lot happening, right? Japan having some very unusual Asian style solutions to everything. So, you know, we need to borrow and not be uh, afraid to borrow from the best. Uh, 
Uh, even, for example, looking at GDPR fines, everybody talks about that. I mean, we have borrowed the whole idea of this uh, very strong enforcement from the FTC. Um, we have seen in this very recent year, FTC actually being incredibly strong regulator. Um, you know, and it's not so much about the fine in, for example, Equifax or, or, or Facebook settlements. It's, you know, anybody can pay the money. But what matters is actually requirement by FTC for these companies to change their practices, to build accountable programs, to have leadership and oversight, uh, external um, assessors, privacy committee, uh, risk assessments, uh, new rules, new tools, training. Like that's what matters to me, right? And so that's what we should be importing elsewhere, right? So, you know, I kind of think we really are more um, um, similar and we have, to we have to bridge and build on what in, we have in common as opposed to digging deeper in what uh, puts us apart. Now, we at CIPL work a lot on trying to actually build those bridges, trying to um, uh, enlighten different countries in the developing or developed world as to what works. Um, and there are several elements that I think are really elements of a progressive new data protection approach to regulation. One is principle-based approach. Look, principles have survived. Even in COVID, it was the principles of fairness, of proportionality, of transparency that really are helping us find the way through. We have those principles from the US to Africa and Asia and Latin America. And I would like us to be able to build on those principles that actually balance the need for responsible data use, data-driven innovation and economic growth all around the world and protection of privacy. So both benefits and risks of processing. Second point is, um, and this is something I actually agree with David very much, we want empowered people, in, empowered individuals, but we are not going to empower people by consents, by asking them to consent to everything. Like, I don't have time for that. I want the organizations who use my data to be responsible, to have that fiduciary duty when they're using my data, but also to give me value and to give create the value for me. So the onus has to be on organizations. Empowered individual is the one who can use their rights, who can have transparency, but it's up to organizations to be accountable. The third point is smart regulators. And I know you've had Liz Denham today. I know you've got lots of other regulators speaking on your data privacy day. And I think they have said this to you. You know, we need regulators who are ready to regulate in this new world with a um, risk-based approach, focusing on areas that really create risks and harms to people as opposed to technical breaches of law. Nobody cares about technical breaches of law. Like that's boring, but people do care about taking action where it really matters, but also being transparent, being strategic and selective to be effective, right? Because they can't deal with thousands of complaints. They can't deal with thousands of breach notifications. They want, they should be actually having time to constructively engage and have thought leadership with accountable organizations. That's what I would like to see regulators do, right? And then finally, I'd like to see them use also innovative regulatory tools. Um, and I hope we have a chance to talk more about this, but there is a great um, promise in, for example, regulatory sandboxes, and they're being used by the UK ICO, by Norwegian, by Singapore DPAs. We, I would like all DPAs to enable this responsible innovation with companies and public sector bodies for really cutting edge technologies, cutting edge public private sector, public sector uses of data, so that we can work together with this feedback loop, reiterative process, create better tools, better technology. And there's some other innovative ways of doing that through policy, policy prototyping, um, uh, and happy to talk about that more, but, but we need different ways of regulating and different tools. And my final point is, there is something to be explored around data ethics review boards. Um, I'm excited about that um, uh, possibility. It would take away uh, uh, some burden from the regulators. It would enable an independent body to perhaps uh, have a, a say. Very interesting what we are seeing in Facebook space, right? Facebook having an external content moderation board, which is actually giving that them some advice and, and a kind of ruling whether you should pull down um, hateful speech or um, abusive uh, uh, posts, right? And I think that is the future. The future lies in these innovative tools where we are able to engage a little bit more constructively. So um, I'll stop here, but very happy to pick up some of this discussion in the future. 
question. Thank you, Boy. Thank you, Boyana. That's a, there's just so much, so much to talk about in what you just raised. Um, so much of it resonates with so many of the topics that we're dealing with right now at the International Finance Corporation. Um, the ethics issues, um, this regulatory sandbox is most intriguing. I hope to to learn more about that. Um, so thank you for bringing all those points up. Now I would like to turn to David. Um, David. Your team's research in India and Kenya has produced findings that run contrary to the privacy paradox discourse that has developed over the past few decades. And um, for the people in the audience who may not be familiar with the privacy paradox, in short, it describes the discrepancy between a person's attitude towards privacy and their actual behavior. Um, so David, my first question to you is, did your findings come as a surprise to you? particularly when the research period spilled over into the beginning of COVID. And I do have a follow-up question as well. Um, and more generally, building on the findings, what practical advice could you offer to, and whose ears would you uh, hope it reaches? <laughs> Um, thanks, Jennifer. Uh, the findings were very surprising. Um, uh, I think people have for a long time have thought about the parody, privacy paradoxes being uh, it, we care about privacy, but we don't act on privacy. But we wanted to test whether poor people in developing countries actually did act on their privacy concerns because that informs self-regulation as well as uh, the need for legislation. Um, and so we wanted to test uh, people's adoption of financial products um, to see how that played out. And so we did two rounds of testing, a simulated testing in, um, in Kenya and India, uh, followed by real world tests of whether consumers made financial decisions. So starting in the simulation tests, which preceded COVID, um, we offered people uh, loans in both those countries that were simulated, but uh, one, lo one loan was maybe two or 3% higher interest rate than the other loan. Uh, and you paid more and you got privacy protections like uh, not limiting access to your data. What we found is 64 or 63%, depending on India or Kenya, of people were willing to pay the higher price loan if it offered privacy protection. And to not make it purely financial, in India, we set up two tables. We set up the no privacy table and we set up the privacy table uh, for getting a loan. And, and you had to wait longer. You, to, you wait 10 minutes to get your loan uh, for the no privacy table, but 30 minutes for the privacy table. And we found 82% of people were willing to wait a longer time to get a loan that had protected their privacy. Now, there been a, may have been a social element, which was the bigger, as the crowd grew on the privacy protective side, people sort of tend to accumulate there. But uh, nonetheless, I think people showed uh, a strong interest in that. Um, but then we, we moved on to uh, doing real world testing uh, of it where actual loans were being given out. Um, and in Kenya, we offered a 4% loan, uh, giving full access to your data and a 6% loan uh, where your data was anonymized, deleted after use, uh, you had to consent to further use of the data. Um, and to avoid stressing people out too much, uh, we had no penalties or fees on it. And then just as a quick aside, at the end of this experiment, we gave everyone their money back uh, and forgave all the loans. Um, uh, but of course, people didn't know that at the time. Um, and the, what we found there, and this was during COVID. Okay, so thinking about the financial stresses we were all under, and particularly poor people in developing countries were under uh, during COVID, 52% of people still opted for the higher price loan. Um, uh, and these are people from... Uh, um, Kibera, which is a very poor part of Nairobi, uh, took, a, took the higher price loan. And when we asked them afterwards, 84% of them said privacy was an important part of their decision. And even if the people who took the lower price loan, 60% still said they cared about privacy. Um, and then we asked them, you paid 10 shillings uh, extra for your loan. How much more would you have paid for privacy if, we'd, if we had raised the price of privacy? And some said they'd almost pay 40 shillings uh, extra for privacy protective loans. So we saw people were really acting on their uh, concerns about privacy. In India, uh, we worked with a company that offered remittances um, to money transfers to consumers uh, and said, uh, if you were willing to essentially get a normal remittance, um, uh, with privacy protection, you would charge one price, but we'll give you a discount if you'll give up your privacy. Um, and we had an opportunity in this case where we did testing both before and during COVID. So pre-COVID, 63% took the discount. That is, they were giving, they were, I'm sorry, 
refuse the discount because they want the more privacy protected. So they were willing to pay effectively more for their remittance by giving up a discount. During COVID, um, that number only dropped from 63% to 53%. So we still had a majority of people um, in India uh, giving up a discount uh, to protect their privacy in, in the heart of COVID. Um, so what do, we, what do we get take about this? One is poor people care about their privacy. Uh, that may, uh, when I started at CGAP, a lot of people told me poor people don't care about their privacy and that we should, why are we focusing on data protection? I think this, these, all these tests demonstrate clearly poor people care about their privacy. Um, we found these results consistent across markets on types of loans um, and, uh, and again, we were targeting very, very poor people in both Kenya and India. So the message I think to providers is uh, adopt your products so that they are privacy sensitive, that you, you should market privacy because it's a good competition tool um, and you should market privacy because consumers want it uh, in, in all markets, both poor, rich and poor. And then as to policymakers, for those countries we've heard, 120 or so countries in the world have privacy laws. Those who are remaining, uh, this may be this is a wake-up call to say your constituents, your consumers in your country care about privacy, uh, and it's important to, to adopt privacy laws, not only to reward those who uh, companies that offer privacy voluntarily, but make it a level playing field so everyone gets the benefits of privacy protections. Thanks. David, thank you. Um, fascinating as always to see this, this research um, evolve um, over time, and especially in the COVID period. And, and seeing privacy really as a business enabler is, is an interesting um, you know, revelation, I suppose. Um, now let's um, turn to the general discussion portion of our program. And we have about, I'm gonna say about 10 minutes uh, to ask um, sort of questions to the whole panel. So people can just jump in um, if, if you have a response. And um, let's try to get through a few of these so let's try to keep our responses as, as short as possible. Um, my first question to the panel is, if, caught, if, if COVID taught us one thing is, is that trust is not earned overnight. Uh, many many well-designed and minimally intrusive apps failed simply because people did not trust them enough to download and use them. So my question is, what do you believe the root causes of this are? And what are the best ways for both policymakers and industry professionals to begin repairing the relationship with the, re with the public? Um, open it up to anybody who'd like to jump in. Uh, I'll say something quick and brief. Um, trust is now going to be the currency um, for a vast number of players. If I'm a big company and I suddenly want to be in healthcare, but uh, I know of you as you know some online tool. I might be uh, cautious um, if I'm going to use a COVID-related app. And I think where we have really failed is figuring out how to communicate who and what actually is trusted, right? Do I look for colors? Does it work fast? All of a sudden, I, I trust it. And where we really haven't been very successful, and, and frankly, as regulators and policymakers, do you know how we try to do this? We say, put more things in your privacy statement and state a lot of legalistic things. And then we say, well, why aren't people making it easy and clear when they've just mandated another thousand words that they need to include? Um, in California, we've tried to come up with a, a design that can go next to the button that says, do not sell. And when you look at the you know, results, you say, wait a second, is that actually going to communicate you know, properly with people? Look, there are designers. Um, we, the legal folks, need to step aside a little bit and ask some of the effective designers, how do you communicate in a way that really empowers people so they understand that the controls work in the way they expect? And then we can go ahead and put law and policy behind when we're working with the feedback from actual uh, individuals. And it may work differently in different cultures. But right now, we start with the law, and then we say, put up words and click on buttons, and we expect that people are empowered. We need to really work back by studying and asking and working with people and then designing to match what they need. Can I add a couple uh, points to that? Um, two, things I would, two issues I would raise there as a follow-up are efficacy and transparency. And I think these apply to COVID apps as well as national security programs. Uh, on the efficacy side is convince people that it's going to work. Uh, I mean, we've seen national security programs where they collect lots of data and don't catch the bad guys. 
Um, uh, here, uh, are we collecting a lot of data on, on medical conditions and tr movements and so forth? And is it really working to help prevent COVID or are we just collecting this data? And then on the transparency side is explain what data is being collected. How is it being used? Is it centralized, decentralized? How long is it kept? Is it disposed of properly? Uh, is it being shared with the government? I think, I think those are concerns that people have and, and until they, they, they understand it, how, how can they trust um, the apps? And I think the fact that the apps haven't gotten a huge pickup may be a testament to the fact that the messaging or practices weren't there. Um, Jennifer and everybody, so I completely agree. We, we do uh, live in the time of incredible trust deficit, um, digital trust deficit, and we have to deal with that. I actually think all of us chief privacy officers, I think we are going to be chief data trust officers in about four years. I think that's what companies are going to want to uh, employ. And these are the kind of people that have to lead these efforts. Um, and, and why it happened? Well, you know, uh, we have this fourth industrial revolution is a massive disruption and we haven't brought people with us through that revolution. I mean, leadership is about bringing, taking people with you to follow you. We haven't done that. You know, we were too fast, too speedy. Every day, every company is a data company. You know, it took 100, um, uh, it took um, 75 years for 100 million users to use a phone and just one day for 100 million people to use Pokemon Go. Remember that augmented reality uh, game, right? When everybody was walking and, and playing. So so I, I, I totally agree with, with Jules. And I think there is something to be said here that the answer to this trust deficit and how we deal with it is that is we're not going to deal that by, by passing more laws and finding more people. Listen, the purpose of, of, of my accountability the purpose of a regulator is not to fine he is not to comply with the law the purpose is to actually get people to step up the game to be more transparent to use data more responsibly to actually get better trust in the marketplace that's the outcome we're trying to achieve and we should achieve it also by looking a little bit how do we deal with these things is an access request a legal request i know max does lots of access requests to test the system? Or is it a question of customer relationship? Is this person really not understanding where data is, what we're doing about that, right? Because that's a customer relationship issue, right? It's uh, the transparency as well. Transparency is not about writing privacy policies and notices as per Article 13 and 14. But you know, I understand why we do that because we are scared to be fined, but that's not the mental set. The mental mindset has to be, how do we give meaningful transparency? How do we explain value exchange? How do we explain to these people, what is it in for them? Where do they go to complain? Maybe we explain to them what we will not do with the data. Maybe we explain to them, here is who your check privacy officer, here is where you have to go and ask a question. So, you know, we need to change mindset and it's not going to be helpful if we keep insisting on legal compliance all the time. And final point is uh, with that transparency that David talks about um, and accountability I talk about, I think, you know, we are seeing an inter some interesting examples where we are actually engaging with the uh, NGOs, engaging with civil society, asking them questions. Um, Google just announced, for example, European uh, Transparency Data Center to actually check the content moderation in, you know, in, in light of this, all these new legal changes. Well, why not have something like that for transparency and privacy? I think everybody would like it. I'm sure Max and, and his NGO would like that. We would like that as people. So there are some good examples out there. Ethics review boards, again, interesting idea, right? Because that can help provide yet another level of that oversight um, over what we companies or public sector are doing without actually recur recurring to the regulator immediately. So that's what we, I think, we need to do to actually build trust again. Once we lose trust, it's very difficult to build it up. If I can add to that right away, the trust is lost. I think that is that is fundamentally the problem. And um, it's I, I, I kind of disagree with the idea that we need less enforcement. Um, you know, we have regulators like in Ireland that, that regulates most of the European market. And 99% of all the complaints that are filed there, which are to the vast majority very legitimate complaints, are simply not even followed up with. So instead of having more sandboxes and engagement or whatever, a, a fine here or there would sometimes help to get a lot of that trust back because companies would behave partly different. And um, I think that is uh, that is something where 
I mean, I know Sipil has kind of that policy and so on, but the reality is it didn't work out. And I give you a very concrete example. In Austria, the um, Red Cross started a COVID tracking app. It was actually earlier than most other countries in Europe. And it was very well designed. It was a very privacy friendly app. Now, they called up me and hundreds of other people that are known in Austria to be trustworthy figures to say you can trust that app. Even friends of mine that are doctors that understand that, that have, you know, our privacy, you know, aware, did not install that app because it had the word tracking in it, it had the word COVID in it, and it was an app on the phone. And people fundamentally distrust app on the phone because they know all of them suck up their data. And quite honestly, um, we have looked at hundreds of apps and web pages. There's hardly one that is even remotely compliant with the GDPR right now. Um, and and that, is, that is something that people obviously don't read or understand in detail, but the stomach feeling of, I'm, my data gets misused every day is there. And, and that is something that is not because they read the privacy policy and know all the details of the background, but that is because they know what's really going out, on out there in the market space. And I think um, unless there is serious, serious shift in market to, to really be compliant and really think what my customer wants, not what I think my customer would like to have because I would like to make money from it, um, but what they really want, we, we're not gonna realistically get there. And, and if you can learn anything from, from the EU is how we are great on putting out all these papers. I totally agree on that side, but we're very, very bad at, at enforcing or policing it. And um, it's, it, I sometimes feel like, you know, if in the whole city of Vienna, there would be one parking sheriff that would like issue one euro fines, then no one in the world would park in the right spot. <laughs> and that is kind of how we do privacy. And it's, it's, it's um, fascinating, especially if it's fundamental right. It's not just some consumer right or something, it's a fundamental right. And, um, you know, talking about, for example, Ireland, because that's the ones we deal with the most, but it's other DPS just as well. Um, if I have a fundamental right to vote and 99% of the time there's no voting box available, then people understand that they actually don't have a right to vote. And that is kind of the reason why people don't trust that. And I think that is what we'll have to cope with. And, and by asking regulators to guide people more, it will, to a large extent, take away the resources to actually enforce things that are plainly obvious in plain sight. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Uh, this has been a fantastic conversation, and I really wish we could continue on for another hour. But unfortunately, I'm afraid we're coming up against the end of our, our time. So um, I am going to now ask, uh, turn to Dr. Sandy Okoro, who is the World Bank Group General Counsel and Compliance Vice President, and ask Sandy to make some closing remarks for us today to wrap us up. Uh, Sandy, thanks so much for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you, Jennifer. I don't know quite how to follow that. That was absolutely wonderful. I was riveted. So happy Data Privacy Day uh, to everybody. Um, I agree with Oyana, that should be every day should be data privacy day and every day should be Valentine's Day. So I'm up for that. <laughs> I, I really think but we, and we could do with that in this uh, time of COVID, I think. Um, thank you again, wonderful panelists. You've been absolutely superb and really frank and flowing in your conversation. That's that's much appreciated. Um, and thanks to the audience as well uh, online. These are unusual times for all of us. Um, but we are adapting and I think we're doing it um, very well. And as David said in one of his comments, you know, we're not living in the 90s anymore. We're not living in the 90s. So we need to dial forward to um, 2021 when we look at everything. Um, so um, again, thanks to each of our panelists, to Jules, to Max, to Bayana and David. Thank you so much. Um, you've really had your, your hands full um, with um, um, you know, doing all of this during the time of COVID, conducting research, surveying, analyzing, um, and keeping and ensuring that accountability doesn't drop just because we are in unusual times. And I am grateful uh, to you for that. And I think the whole, all of the general public is as well, because accountability and keeping standards up are really, really important. And this has been a fantastic opportunity to um, look inside your thought processes and to understand what you're thinking a bit more and to navigate your, you know, the, the um, obstacles that we have and look at all the different things that are on your plate. So really, thank you very much for your incredible contributions. Um, yours are powerful voices. Um, if you didn't know that before, we know that now. And it's really important to have those powerful voices out there, particularly to protect the most vulnerable. OK, and I think that sometimes when um, it's the most vulnerable that are vulnerable for misuse, um, 
facilitator. And I think it's really important that we remember that. Um, so the use of our voice and agency is really important in this um, area. So within a few days, very, very, very soon, um, we are about to launch um, the World Bank Group data privacy policy. It's going to go live soon. Uh, it's been a labour of love, um, and um, but well worth it. Um, and it's reinforced at the bank how critical data privacy is and that the public have a voice in the room and have all the information necessary um, to make the informed choices that they need to make. So this really is bringing things uh, forward for us. Um, this endeavour has been unprecedented, I think, amongst international organisations. Um, so it's been a bit of a greenfield site, but we have got there. So I'm immensely proud of the team and everybody who's been involved. So kudos to, to all of you and, and big thanks to. Um, you know, when people put um, trust in others, as we do with our data, um, we have to be responsible in handling that. And everybody requires that same level of responsibility and accountability. Just because you're poor does not mean you deserve any less. Um, and I think that's something that we've been taking very, very seriously um, at the bank. So, you know, for our esteemed panelists, um, I will um, release you to the rest of your day. Um, I also uh, want to thank everyone who's been behind um, this Data Privacy Day uh, here at the bank. It's been absolutely wonderful. Um, some amazing um, um, sessions, um, more to come, I think, as well. Um, and Jennifer, thank you for wonderful moderating. It's great to see you. It's been a while since we've been it in has. the same room it together has. to discuss oh, nice data privacy. We, yes, we, yes. We, we had many sessions together to, to get, this, um, get this going in a small room all sitting together. It's hard to imagine those days and we hope they are back soon. Um, so anyway, for everyone who has joined in, who has tuned in, who has been part of this discussion and is part of the help, thank you. Um, Data Privacy Day at the World Bank Group is an important day. It's an important day generally um, across the world, but important for us as we are about to launch this new policy. So I look forward very much to continuing these very engaging discussions on data privacy going forward every day, as Brianna says, every day. Um, okay, so Jennifer, let me hand back to you and thank you very much and thank you everybody. Thank you. Sandy, thanks so much. Always a pleasure to see you. Um, I hope you have all enjoyed this energetic and engaging discussion as much as I have. And for those of you in the audience, please do stay Stay with us for the rest of the World Bank Group Data Privacy Day. Coming up next, we have a round table with CEOs and CIOs from the private sector and the World Bank Group who, who will be focusing on the technology dimension of data privacy. So we hope you'll all be able to join us for that. And Max, Jules, Bayana, and David, thank you again so much. It's truly is a pleasure. Have a great day and evening. <laughs>